The Venom symbiote suit is an iconic part of comic book history, but how it came about was a lot more complicated than you might think. This black and red costume is how it originally looked, but it finally came to comics 37 years later. Buckle yourselves in, guys, because we're going to be taking a deep dive into the history of the Lost Spider-Man suit. So, back in the 80s, Marvel ran a contest for aspiring comic writers to pitch their ideas to the company. One such participant was a dude from Chicago named Randy Schuler, and he actually told his story to CBR back in 2007, which I am going to be pulling a lot of information from. Schuler pitched a story that would upgrade Spider-Man's powers and looks, and he would kill two birds with one stone by having a high-tech costume designed as a gift by Reed Richards of the Fantastic Four and fashionista extraordinaire Janet Van Dyne. This new costume would be a stealth-oriented suit that was entirely black, save for a blood-red spider emblem. It was to be made out of the same unstable molecules as the Fantastic Four's uniforms, and would allow Spider-Man to cling to walls a lot better. It was also going to feature underarm glider webbing, much like the original Spidey costume, but this was actually going to extend to be practically the length of his entire body, kind of like one of those skydiving wingsuits. Plus, the new costume would also have cybernetic web shooters that responded to mental commands. As a trade-off, though, this cybernetic system did block Parker's spider sense. Included in the letter to CBR was an image of the response that Schuler received from Marvel's then editor in chief, Jim Shooter. Cutting right to the point, Shooter said, I want to buy it, and offered to pay $220, about $580 when adjusted for inflation, for the concept and gave Shuler the opportunity to write the story himself. Schuler accepted the deal, wrote a second draft, and had a couple of phone calls with editor Tom DeFalco to develop the script. In an interview with Back Issues magazine, DeFalco mentioned that the story was supposed to take place over the course of a single issue, with Spider-Man getting the new costume, using it for a little bit, and then getting rid of it entirely at the end of the issue. While Schuler doesn't remember the exact reasoning of why this never came to fruition, DeFalco claims that after months of working with the novice writer, it was clear that they weren't going to end up with a quality story, and the deal fell apart as a result. However, Randy Schuler said that he has no regrets about this, and that the entire thing was a very cool moment in his life. Still, even though the issue didn't go anywhere, Marvel still owned the idea of the black suit, and the concept would see new life in the iconic 1984 event, Secret Wars. Admittedly, this event mostly existed so that the toy company Mattel could release a line of action figures in order to go up against DC's toy line, which was being handled by rival company Kenner. Written by Jim Shooter and edited by Tom DeFalco, the Secret Wars event would also be the catalyst for many changes to the Marvel status quo. She-Hulk replaced the Thing on the Fantastic Four, there was a new Spider-Woman in town, the Hulk had a broken leg, and of course, Spider-Man had a new costume. However, news about the black suit leaked before it was introduced, and the fans hated the idea despite not really knowing anything. While the outrage of fanboys getting mad about something that they haven't even read seems like a modern day problem, the Marvel staff received an absolute flood of angry letters about this in 1984. Because of this, many writers did not want to be on the receiving end of criticism when the outfit was finally going to be introduced in the Amazing Spider-Man series, prompting DeFalco to take over the writing duties. In the meantime, the Marvel staff tried to calm their audience down by releasing concept art of the new costume design in issue 12 of their official news magazine, Marvel. Age. What we saw was very much in line with Schuler's original idea, save for the glider webbing being absent, and the addition of these little patches on his hands where webs would fire from. A note on the concept art asks if these web shooters would be mechanical or organic, which we now know would end up as the latter. Still, the backlash was scathing, and Jim Shooter wanted to ditch the new design after only one issue, but there was a slight problem to this plan. See, although Spidey got the black suit in the Secret Wars event, it wasn't actually going to be released when the costume itself was going to make its first appearance in the Amazing Spider-Man series. Yeah, so Secret Wars is all about multiple heroes and villains being transported to a strange planet called Battle World. To help hype up the event, the heroes would disappear at the end of an issue in their own book and return from Battle World at the beginning of the next with these new changes in tow. If curious readers wanted to know what happened, then they were going to need to pick up Secret Wars, which would release soon after. This created an awkward situation where Jim Shooter wanted to get rid of the new Spider-Man costume before they actually even introduced its origins. Despite the fan outcry, the team was going to have to let it ride. 
While all of this frustration was going on at Marvel, Mattel on the other hand was super excited for the black suit, since it now means that they could sell two versions of their new Spider-Man action figure. When Amazing Spider-Man number 252 was finally released and the world was introduced to the wall crawler's new look, the fans actually loved it. The issue was selling out left and right, with one scalper even charging 50 bucks for it, which is about $124 today when adjusted for inflation. Oh, would you look at that? Whiny fanboys yelling about Marvel stuff that they've never seen ended up doing nothing to harm the success of a controversial new release. Gotta love how history repeats itself. Now, obviously, the red accents on the suit were changed to white, but Secret Wars No. 8 finally rolled around and introduced the outfit's origin. In the book, Spider-Man tried using a machine to make him a new costume, and this black goo kind of just popped out of it. The explanation for the design change was that Peter must have subconsciously been influenced by the costume of the brand new Spider-Woman that he met on Battleworld. Yeah, this whole origin was clearly very different from the original idea that Schuler sent in a couple of years prior, which he said was both thrilling and saddening. It also hurts to hear a bit that Schuler admitted that he was never really a fan of Venom, the character that the black suit would eventually evolve into. Ordinarily, this is where the story ends, and I'm not gonna pretend like I'm the first comic book historian to talk about this online, but what got me interested in making this video is that the original red and black suit is back 37 years later, and it's actually really cool how it came about. So, in honor of Marvel's 80th anniversary, they released several Spider-Man one-shots. Most notably for this video is the sensational Spider-Man self-improvement, which contains two stories. The first one is actually an adaptation of Randy Schuler's original pitch from all the way back in 1982. This new adaptation, titled Burn Job, had Spider-Man going up against a minor villain named Firebrand, who burned through the webhead's costume. Thankfully, the Human Torch was in the area, helped out, and brought Spider-Man back to the Baxter building for Mr. Fantastic to patch up. With Parker's costume out of commission, Mr. Fantastic kind of just threw together an insanely powerful new black and red outfit for Spidey to wear. It's made out of unstable molecules, and while it doesn't increase Spider-Man's sticking ability, it facilitated a completely original upgrade in that it is completely fireproof down to the webbing. Not to mention that Richards improved on Spider-Man's web shooter design, having them built right into the costume and activated via a cybernetic link. Unlike the concept art for the Secret Wars suit, this new adaptation features the underarm webbing, albeit not as dramatic as the wingsuit that Schuler originally pitched. Additionally, while the adaptation's costume doesn't seem to interfere with the spider sense, the new web shooters were too wonky for Peter to use effectively. Despite the difficulties of using the new suit, Spider-Man was able to defeat Firebrand and save the day, but he ultimately decided to return the costume to the Fantastic Four since he didn't like how evil it made him look. Obviously, this story is still pretty different from the one that Randy Schuler pitched, but it's honestly great to see that he got the credit for the idea, especially since he lamented in the letter to CBR that he never received any kind of credit for the costume inspiration in the old school comics. Up until this point, the only real credit that Randy got was a very very quick reference in the 2018 Venom movie. I got him, he's in the alley behind the Schuler building. The rest of the self-improvement one-shot was pretty neat as a fan of Marvel history, since it included pictures and transcriptions of the first two drafts of the original storyline that Schuler wrote out, along with the notes that editor Tom DeFalco added on the latter. Now, I'm sure that many of you guys are probably wondering if the red and black suit is canon to the main comic book universe. And look, as much as I love the Marvel wiki, one of my biggest complaints about it is that they label pretty much any comic that doesn't explicitly say that it's in an alternate universe as canon to the main in continuity. In my personal opinion, I think that the self-improvement one-shot doesn't count because of two important key factors. The first one is that this firebrand is a character named Russell Broxtel, who didn't appear in the comic books until 1991. If this was meant to take place around 1982 when the pitch was sent in, and as the adaptation implies, then the firebrand character would need to be Gary Gilbert, who was first introduced in 1970. Second, when Reed Richards eventually discovers that Spider-Man's black suit is a symbiote, he helps get it off of him. Since Peter was mostly naked and he still needed to protect his identity, Johnny Storm let him borrow a spare Fantastic Four uniform and a bag for his head. Although this is hilarious, it would be entirely unnecessary if Reed still had the red and black suit laying around, and it's unlikely that he would ever throw it away. 
So yeah, I know it's disappointing that the red and black suit is most likely not canon, but I hope this video at least better explains why I think that the self-improvement one-shot is just really cool from a Marvel history perspective, and hopefully now that you know this story, you can go like impress your friends or something. Yeah, 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 Spider-Man has saved countless lives and put dozens of supervillains behind bars, but there are still some people out there that think he's a menace. One sec. Now, here on Comic Drake, we like to go through insanely deep dives, and today I want to talk about every single crime that Spider-Man has ever committed. So let's set up some ground rules. For this video, I am not going to be talking about the kind of stuff that every single superhero does as a part of being a vigilante. You know, stuff like trespassing, collateral damage, breaking and entering, and violence, that kind of stuff. That happens like five times an issue, and if I were to go through all of that, this would be like the most boring 10-hour video of all time. Second, this is strictly going to be about the mainstream Marvel Comics universe, otherwise we would have to count Peter jaywalking in the first Spider-Man movie, or more importantly, when he hacked several phones and launched a missile at his classmate in Far From Home. So with all of that out of the way, let's dive in. Let's get the obvious one out of the way first. Peter has made most of his living by selling pictures of himself as Spider-Man to the Daily Bugle, directly lying about their origins. In fact, when Parker revealed his secret identity during the Civil War event, the Bugle sued him. But you might be interested in knowing that Peter also has a long history of selling fake and doctored photos. This started as early as the fourth issue of his series, where after not being able to get shots of his fight with the Sandman, Peter faked it by throwing sand in the air and jumping through it. Just a few issues later, Parker needed money for his Aunt May's medical expenses, so he sold J. Jonah Jameson a doctored photo that made it look like Spider-Man was also the villain Electro. Although the Bugle ran with this story, it was debunked pretty quickly when Jameson himself witnessed Spider-Man and Electro fighting. Furious, Jonah was going to sue Parker for fraud, but when Peter offered to give him exclusive shots of that fight between Electro and Spider-Man for free, all was forgiven. But still, those initial fakes were definitely illegal. Years later, Jameson received photos from an anonymous source showing Spider-Man disposing of one of his clone bodies in an incineration plant. Because comics. Actually, come to think of it, I think that trespassing onto government property to get rid of a body, even a cloned one, has to be illegal in its own right. Right? Anyway, these pictures convinced Jonah that Spider-Man had actually killed Peter Parker and was now impersonating him. So in order to put those suspicions to rest, Peter broke into Jameson's office, stole the photos, and tampered with them. So when Jameson confronted Parker about actually being Spider-Man in disguise, Peter was able to prove that his evidence was quote-unquote fake. Much later in Spider-Man's history, Jameson was actually elected as the mayor of New York City, and Peter was hired on as his official photographer. Well, word got around that near the beginning of his vendetta against Spider-Man, Jonah had funded the creation of a supervillain named the Scorpion. So when a new villain called the Vulture came to town, the media was convinced that Jameson was somehow involved. In order to prove his innocence, Peter photoshopped an image of Jonah fighting off the Vulture, which seriously helped with his public approval. But as a man with at least some integrity, Jameson called a press conference to publicly disprove the photo and fire Parker on the spot. So that's all of the fraud that I can find in Spidey's life, but there is still way more crimes to count. Like, how about the time that Spider-Man got amnesia and was tricked into working for Dr. Octopus? He snapped out of it pretty quickly, but he absolutely stole a few things under Ock's influence. There was also the time that Peter was delirious and robbed a jewelry store when he needed to get Gwen Stacy a birthday present. I mean, he was able to come to his senses and stopped midway, but there was totally still the intent to burgle. Yet, if there is one thing that Parker is prone to stealing, it's food. Like, this sandwich, this dude's McDonald's, the thing's cannoli, and the time that he ate some brownies that Aunt May had baked for the homeless and then lied about it. There's also a couple of times where he's stolen some costume stuff, like this mask from a costume shop when he lost his during a fight with Doc Ock, and he's also broken into J. Jonah Jameson's office a couple of times to take his costume back when it landed in the Bugle's possession. Theft aside though, Spider-Man hasn't always been the most responsible hero and has let his personal life get in the way of saving folks. For instance, there was the time that Aunt May had vanished and Peter was worried about her. So worried, in fact, that he let both a mugging and a kidnapping slide while he was trying to find her. But it turns out that there was wasn't much reason to worry, since in reality, May had just picked up work as Doc Ock's live-in housekeeper. But the dudes being mugged and kidnapped? They're probably not doing as well. Oh, and fun fact before we move on, Aunt May shot Spider-Man when he broke into Ock's house. So now, how about some vehicle-related crimes? 
First of all, Peter never should have been able to drive his Spider-Mobile since he didn't have a license. In addition to saving him from the future embarrassment of, you know, having a Spider-Mobile, this also would have prevented him from defacing property with all of the tire marks that the car left. But Spider-Man has still been proven to break vehicle laws even when he's not the one behind the wheel, because riding on top of a car is also illegal. In fact, Spidey once pulled up right next to a cop while riding on top of a car and said, bet you a buck this isn't covered by New York City traffic regs. It was, and he got a ticket. By the way, that last scene happened during a storyline where Spider-Man worked for the mob. I mean, it technically wasn't illegal since Peter was just doing what he normally does, protecting people. Also, I don't have a clever segue for it, but Peter absolutely hit Mary Jane while she was pregnant. This was during the infamous Clone Saga, which is a whole can of worms that we don't have time to get into in this video. All you really need to know is that Parker has a clone named Ben Riley, and during this part of the saga, it was revealed that they had it wrong this entire time. Apparently, Ben Riley was the real Peter Parker, and the Peter that we had been following was in fact the clone. Now, that ended up not being true, but in the moment, Peter was worried that Ben was going to take over his life, so they fought. When MJ tried interjecting, Peter smacked her away without really thinking about it. Peter instantly regretted it, and while I am by no means condoning domestic abuse, I can't help but find it interesting that this is extremely similar to when Hank Pym hit his wife all those years ago. For Pym, the label of wife-beater clung to him for decades, but Parker, oddly enough, never got the same treatment. Anyway, this is an extremely heavy subject, so let's just move on to the next point. As mentioned earlier, Peter revealed his identity during the Civil War event, but he later defected from Iron Man's side and joined up with Captain America's group, who, in the eyes of the government, were criminals in violation of the Superhuman Registration Act. Immediately following the war, Aunt May was shot, which led to the largest string of felonies that Spider-Man has ever committed. First, he dropped off May at the hospital without filing a police report. He then took out his anger on small-time criminals through excessive violence. This is exemplified when Parker found out that the Kingpin was the one who orchestrated the hit against his family. So Peter broke into the prison that he was being held in and savagely beat the Kingpin to a pulp. Now, the police were starting to get suspicious of May's connection to Peter, who again was a fugitive from the law due to the Superhuman Registration Act. So Parker assaulted a cop, tied him up, fled the scene of the crime, stole an ambulance, broke into the hospital supply closet, impersonated a doctor, had Mary Jane steal May's forms, and they smuggled her out of the hospital. All of this really doesn't matter though, since this period of Peter's life was rewritten when he sold his marriage to the devil. That last one's not exactly illegal, but working with the devil is still pretty shady. But hey, now that Peter is single again, he was able to fool around with his ex-girlfriend, Black Cat. Spidey was under the impression that the hotel room they were in when they hooked up was paid for. But Felicia left in the middle of the night, which means that the newlywed couple that did book it walked in on a mostly naked Spider-Man laying in their bed. Years later, Peter and Dr. Octopus switched bodies, and during this time, Octavius got Parker his PhD and established a technology company that grew into an international multi-billion dollar brand. When Peter eventually got his body back, he was actually stripped of his degree when a high-tech algorithm discovered that his thesis had plagiarized the work of Otto Octavius. And that's not all. In order to prevent the damage being caused by a deadly virus, Parker hacked into every single device that his company had sold in order to transmit a painful high-pitched signal that stopped it. This was kind of like a precursor to when he bricked all of those same devices as a measure to prevent his company from being taken over by Hydra. But that's getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, because as you see, during his time running Parker Industries, Peter found out that his arch nemesis Norman Osborn had teamed up with the leader of a sovereign nation in order to manufacture weapons. So Parker bankrolled the resistance group and directly joined in the invasion in order to overthrow the government. Yeah, Spider-Man committed war crimes. Who would have thought? Let's end off this video by talking about the felonies that Spider-Man committed regarding murder. Oh yeah, we're going there. To start us off, Norman Osborn had a criminal killed and made it look like Spider-Man had done it. Osborn offered a $5 million bounty to anyone that could bring the wall crawler in, leading Peter to create four new superhero identities to fight crime under while the Spidey persona laid low for a bit. During a mission as one of these new heroes, Peter planted fake evidence that would exonerate Spider-Man from the accused murder, which allowed him to freely operate as the webhead once again. Though this wouldn't be the last time that Spider-Man was accused of killing people. 
Kamala. There was an entire series of homicides that he was framed for, which even landed Spider-Man in jail. However, Parker broke out when he saw that one of his friends had landed in the same prison and was about to be beaten up by the inmates. By using a web shooter that his lawyer, Matt Murdock, had smuggled in, Peter destroyed his power-inhibiting collar, fought off the prisoners, assaulted a guard, broke both him and his friend out of jail, and hot-wired an ambulance for their getaway. So, yeah, that is a whole string of broken laws, but at least Peter has never actually killed someone, right? Well, if we really want to get technical, Parker did accidentally kill Gwen Stacy when he tried to save her, but that's a little different. Plus, there was another accidental killing way back in the 60s when Spider-Man dodged a heat-seeking missile by having it hit the car that it was shot from. Peter didn't know that there was somebody actually in the car and did try to save the dude, but in the end, the criminal still died from his injuries. And what about the time that Spider-Man fought a couple of villains by using one of them as a human shield against his partner's lethal blast? Involuntary manslaughter? self-defense, you decide. But the accidental killing that really stuck with Peter was in 1987's Spider-Man vs. Wolverine. Logan's on-and-off-again partner-slash-lover Charlemagne had done a lot of jobs as a secret agent, and was actively being hunted down by her adversaries. She wanted Logan to give her a quick death rather than fall into enemy hands, but Parker, thinking that Wolverine was just trying to kill her, stepped in in order to prevent the assisted suicide. During the ensuing fight, Charlemagne attacked Spider-Man from behind, knowing that he would think that she was Logan. Under this impression, Parker retaliated with a powerful punch that would be totally fine for Wolverine, but downright deadly to a regular human. Charlemagne might have gotten what she wanted, but this has absolutely haunted Spider-Man for years. On that downer note, that is every single crime that I was able to find Spider-Man committing. And since he's been around for decades, I'm sure that there are some things that I missed. So if you know of any crimes that I didn't mention, then let me know down there in the comments below. Get me Crimes of Spider-Man. The multiverse. Infinite realities where anything that can happen does. Each universe can be interpreted as a thread of a giant spider web, a sprawling tapestry of silk that converges at the center of all reality. This is the web of life and destiny, and it's watched over by special guardians who take up the symbol of the spider. This is their history. For decades, it was made clear that Spider-Man's origin story is that he got his powers from a radioactive spider bite, but nope! It was actually multiversal magic, because comics. You see, Spider-Man is actually something that's known as a spider totem, and they play a huge role in maintaining the fabric of the multiverse. This is a subject that I have avoided talking about for years, because not only is it an extremely controversial part of the Spider-Man mythos, but also because it is a complicated and convoluted mess to explain since every time that a writer tries to elaborate on things, it just results in a dozen more unanswered questions. So today, let's take a dive into the Spider-Verse and try to make sense out of and untangle this extremely complicated web. One of the most iconic writers to take on Spider-Man is J. Michael Straczynski, and during his time on the book, he had Peter swinging around doing his friendly neighborhood stuff, when suddenly, this dude named Ezekiel shows up and is like, What up, Peter? You're a totem. Naturally, this confused the hell out of Parker. I mean, he's a science boy and knew for a fact that the radioactive spider is what gave him his powers. But Ezekiel responded with, Okay, yeah, but who put the spider there in the first place? It's your destiny and you're a totem. Okay, but what the hell does that mean? As Ezekiel puts it, totems are the bridge between animal and man. There's actually all sorts of totems out there, and it's implied that this is why so many of Spider-Man's villains are animal-themed, because totems attract totems. However, this was never really elaborated on, and to be entirely honest, we actually don't know all that much about the other animal totems. Straczynski just kind of put the idea out there, and no writer has ever wanted to touch it. The spiders, on the other hand, have gotten a lot of lore, because unlike the rest of the animals, they're special since they're responsible for maintaining an important piece of the multiverse. See, there's this thing called the Web of Life and Destiny, and only spider totems can sense it. The web is located at the very center of the multiverse, on Earth-001, aka Loom World, a universe made up of bits and pieces of other worlds left over from wars across the multiverse. The web is kind of like the backbone of the multiverse, with its tendrils helping hold together the fabric of reality. It can also be used to teleport around the multiverse, powers the spider sense, and can also be used to make clothes, apparently. The web of life and destiny is overseen by a being called the Master Weaver, but even he is outclassed by a more powerful entity. It goes by many names across cultures, like the African god Anansi, 
but it's most commonly known as the Great Weaver. Yeah, there's the Great Weaver and the Master Weaver, who are two completely different people. And now you're probably starting to understand why this shit gets confusing to explain. Anyway, the bigger and more powerful spider dude lives on the astral plane, and is responsible for deciding who gets to be a spider totem, including the special great totems. These dudes have even more power than the usual spider people, and there's only one of each of them in the entire multiverse. But the majority of them are conveniently located in the mainstream Marvel Comics universe. There's the aforementioned Master Weaver, who looks over and maintains the web of life and destiny, and the Gatekeeper, who oversees mystical forces and acts like the Department of Internal Affairs, passing judgment on totems who aren't worthy of their powers. Then there's the Bride, who inhabits the body of Cindy Moon, aka Silk. She's responsible for spider totems to be born through chance, magic, curses, and unwanted luck. There's also the Scion, who inhabits a kid named Benji Parker. But we don't actually know too much about what he does, since he is a literal baby. Finally, there's the Other. And this one is a big complicated mess. To oversimplify, the Other is basically a supercharged totem with augmented powers and additional ones, like wrist stingers and the ability to turn into a big spider monster. The mainstream comic book Peter was actually the avatar of the Other for a good while. But after reality was rewritten when he sold his marriage to the devil, because comics, the honor of being its host went to Cain, Peter's clone. Anyway, in addition to completely rocking Peter's world with all that totem crap, Ezekiel also drops the bomb that a freaking multiversal vampire is coming after him. This is Morloon, and he's from a group called the Inheritors. Their dad instilled a hunger within them to sustain themselves on the life force of totemic entities. While any totem will do, spiders are the sweetest. And as such, the Inheritors enslaved the Master Weaver and forced him to teleport the vampire family across the multiverse to chow down on these spider snacks. These guys are killing machines. They are insanely strong and seemingly never tire. I mean, hell, Peter once fought Morloon for 12 hours straight, and he showed no signs of slowing down. Their one weakness is radiation. Which is a bit of an issue considering that most of the spider totems are various versions of Peter Parker, who got their powers from a radioactive spider bite. In fact, Peter was able to defeat Morloon the first time around by injecting himself with even more radiation, and when he tried to feed off of Parker's energy, Morloon turned to dust. But here's the thing, the Inheritors are also a bunch of clones! See, whenever an Inheritor dies, their consciousness is uploaded into a cloning tube back on Loom World, meaning that they're effectively immortal through infinite bodies. So now that you understand everyone involved, let's talk about the biggest spider-related conflict of all time. Spider-Verse. Okay, so for years, Ezekiel hid Silk in a bunker so that she could be saved from the Inheritors, but then she was discovered by Peter, which caused him to go into a feeding frenzy and ravage the multiverse like the Flash at an all-you-can-eat buffet. No universe was safe. The 60s cartoon, Marvel vs. Capcom, hell, even the old Hostess snack cake ads. Outside of their pure gluttony, what the Inheritors were truly after are the Great Totems, because by performing a special ritual, they could prevent more Spider Totems from ever being created. Which makes zero sense as a motivation, considering that means that they would be cutting themselves off from their favorite food source. Not a great plan. In retaliation, a bunch of spider folk traverse the Great Web in order to save their Ultimate Universe doppelgangers from being eaten by the vampires and to draft them into their spider army. This includes the superior Spider-Man, who is Dr. Octopus inside of Peter Parker's body. He has a unique way of going about things, because when the Inheritors got their hands on the Great Totems, Otto prevented them from performing the ritual by straight up murdering the Master Weaver. I mean, that's technically a solution. The spiders were ultimately able to foil their plan, with the help of Karn, one of the inheritors who decided to forsake his family and become a good guy, and the vampires were exiled to a universe that was ravaged by nuclear war, where they were kept as weak and frail prisoners. That's all fine and dandy though, but without a Master Weaver, the web was defenseless, so Karn decided to atone for its villainous past by taking up the role. Also, this was apparently his destiny, since it was revealed that the last Master Weaver was an older version of himself. It also became clear that many Spider-Men, and women, and monkeys, were lost during this Great War. And thus, a bunch of Spider-Folk decided to form the Web Warriors, a group that would work with Karn to protect those worlds. Although, there was still some skepticism of the totems working with an Inheritor, leading to this great little interaction of Spider-Punk saying hello to the immortal Invincible Cannibal, who will someday kill them all. 
The first major threat to the Web Warriors was a bunch of alternate universe versions of Electro, who made their own web to try and take over the multiverse. Yeah, the like, one Spider-Man villain that isn't animal themed is the one that gets to do the multiversal shit. By using this false web, the Electros were able to take over Loom World along with the Web of Life and Destiny itself, but thankfully the Web Warriors managed to save the day and kick them out of Loom World. However, the web was badly damaged and tangled due to the abuse that it suffered at the Electro's hands, causing the fabric between realities to deteriorate. With the help of a good version of Dr. Octopus, the team was able to stop each universe from bleeding into each other, and they untangled the web. Only for it to be threatened all over again. This is Spider-Geddon, a full-on sequel to Spider-Verse that was infinitely less popular because it had a worse name. The mainstream Peter Parker really isn't in this event, since he spends more or less the entire time fighting more loon in a park. However, since the book was kind of made to tie into the Into the Spider-Verse movie, it's Miles who's in charge this time around. So Doc Ock recreated the Inheritor's cloning technology to grow himself a new body that's a hybrid of his and Peter's DNA. However, the Inheritors were able to hijack the signal and use it to escape the irradiated world by cloning themselves new bodies in Otto's lab. To be completely honest, this book is more or less just Spider-Verse again, with a multiversal army of spider people getting assembled to stop the Inheritors. Oh, but Karn was killed by his sister this time around, which was kind of important to mention. One of the new spiders is an alternate universe doppelganger of Norman Osborn, who takes advantage of the web losing its guardian by straight up destroying it, with the goal of confining the inheritors to one universe, thus saving the rest of the multiverse from their wrath. Spider Norman's plan ends up not really working, because Annie Mae, the alternate universe child of Peter and Mary Jane, shows up and reveals herself to be a new great totem called the Pattern Maker. I love how the inheritors are like, what the hell, why didn't we know about this chick the last time we did this? Now, get this. The Inheritors were ultimately finished off when Miles obtained an insane cosmic energy force that granted him godlike power, and then he blows up the Inheritors with the big sword from the live-action 70s Sentai show. And to prevent all of this from ever happening again, the Spider-Folk reworked the cloning tubes to put the Inheritors' consciousness into baby versions of themselves. And to raise them to be less evil, they're taken in by Spider-Ma'am. She's from the universe where Aunt May gets bitten by the spider instead of Peter. But knowing comics, these vampire babies are probably going to grow up to be evil all over again, just so Marvel will have an excuse to do yet another big Spider-Verse event. But what about the destroyed web of life and destiny? I mean, it just being tangled was enough to lead to tears in reality. Well, as the pattern maker, Annie Mae spins a brand new one, and it's watched over by a little girl that goes by Spider-Zero. And at the time of this recording, that's really everything that we know related to Spider-Verse and Spider-Totems and all of that nonsense. Like I said at the beginning of this video, all of this complete gobbledygook is a really controversial part of the Spider-Man mythos. Personally, I like bits and pieces of it, but sometimes it can really go off the deep end. However, I'm a big fan of Spider-Verse, so if the price to pay for that awesome story is a little bit of nonsense, then whatever. Back in the 90s, Carnage was one of the most popular comic book villains out there. He's a lean, mean, killing machine with a red color scheme. But something that people often forget about, and or overlook, is that the Carnage symbiote has actually bonded to all sorts of people over the years. And as someone who has read way, way, way too many Spider-Man comics, I'm here to break down the complicated web that is every Carnage ever. But as a heads up, I'm only going to be talking about the mainstream Marvel Comics universe. So for as much fun as characters like Aunt May or Doc Ock getting Carnage might be, I'll need to save them for a future video, which you should totally comment down below on if you'd like to see me talk about them. Obviously, we have to start with the man that started it all, Cletus Cassidy. Cletus is a serial killer that shared a cell with Eddie Brock, who was put in prison after losing the Venom symbiote. Eventually, Venom tracked Eddie down and busted him out, but left behind some residue that mixed with Cletus's blood, which gave birth to Carnage. Now souped up with a symbiote of his own, Cassidy broke out and went on a killing spree, leaving the message Carnage Rules written in blood wherever he went. Cletus and Carnage have the strongest bond out of any symbiote and their host, with Carnage literally being a part of his bloodstream. Because of this, every single time that Cassidy and Carnage have been defeated or separated over decades and decades worth of comics, the two of them are reunited, as there is no possible way to truly pull them apart. No matter the distance or no matter how much damage either of them takes, Cletus and Carnage have proven time and time again that they will always be together to paint the town red. While locked up in the Ravencroft Institute for the Criminally Insane, Cassidy was watched over by its chief of security, John Jameson III. 
He's the son of J. Jonah Jameson, a former astronaut, and used to be a space werewolf. Because comics. In order to break Cletus out of the asylum, Carnage found a way to slip through the defenses and bond with John. However, Carnage was weak after being subjected to the cell's anti-symbiote defenses for so long. So if Carnage was going to spring Cassidy from the asylum, it would need to merge with a much stronger host. Someone like, say, Spider-Man. But all of this was in the 90s, which is arguably the weirdest and most complicated era in all of comic history. So at this time, Peter Parker wasn't Spider-Man. This guy, Ben Riley, was. He's a clone of Peter, but during the Clone Saga, which is one of the most infamous Spider-Man storylines of all time, Peter believed that he was the clone, moved to Portland, and let Ben take over as Spider-Man. Anyway, while trying to keep the infected Jameson at bay, Carnage bonded to Ben, becoming Spider-Carnage which is one of the most 90s names ever made. Although he knew how to get the symbiote off, Ben didn't want to risk Carnage grabbing hold of someone else and wrecking more... Carnage. So Riley tried to keep it at bay. While under the influence of the symbiote, though, Ben's fear, rage, and anxiety were dialed up to 11, making him increasingly paranoid that he might actually be the clone all along. And he totally was. Carnage was constantly whispering in Ben's ear to kill Peter, so that he wouldn't come back from Portland and take over Ben's life. Even though Peter still had his whole life in order, and it was Ben who took on the new identity and started from scratch. Regardless, Ben was able to fight off Carnage's temptation, but his control was rapidly slipping, meaning that it was only a matter of time until Carnage fully took over the driver's seat. In an attempt to learn more about how to control Carnage, Ben broke into Ravencroft to talk to Cassidy. But in all actuality, Carnage was pulling his strings, and was now powerful enough to smash through the cell's defenses and reunite with Cletus once again. A couple of years later, Carnage encountered the Silver Surfer, and the symbiote was so scared of him that he jumped off of Cletus and ran. See, many years ago, the Surfer came to a planet completely overrun with symbiotes, and as per his job, he brought Galactus along with him, who proceeded to devour the world. Since the symbiotes are a hive mind, they remembered the Silver Surfer, causing Carnage to take revenge for his ancestors. The Surfer went into the sewers where Carnage went into hiding, only to be ambushed by the symbiote, becoming the Carnage Cosmic, another one of the most 90s names ever made. Carnage tried its best to fully merge with the Surfer, but wasn't able to. So looking to take advantage of the situation, Spider-Man wanted to destroy the symbiote once and for all. But here's the thing. Cassidy had cancer and the only thing keeping him alive was his bond with Carnage. By destroying the symbiote, though, Spider-Man and the Silver Surfer would be condemning him to death, and not wanting their blood on his hands, even that of a superpowered mass murderer, the heroes make it back to Cletus and forcibly have Carnage rebond with his former host. But to prevent him from ever getting out, the Surfer encased him in a shell of silver. Which was immediately forgotten about, since the next time that we saw Cassidy, he was just chilling in his cell, and that Tomb of Silver has never been brought up again. Now, a few years later, Carnage was flown into space and torn in half by the Sentry. But because this is comic books that we're talking about, he, of course, came back to life. It turns out that Carnage was keeping Cletus alive in space, but just barely. His body was found by industrialist Michael Hall, who extracted fragments of the symbiote in order to create new cybernetic technology, such as Iron Man-like suits and a prosthetic arm for a doctor at Ravencroft. This was Dr. Tandis Neves, and the sliver of carnage inside her arm compelled her to seek out the rest of the symbiote to bond with it. This was short-lived, however, because Carnage then piloted Dr. Neves' body to Cassidy so that it could rebond with him. On top of that, Carnage left its child inside of her arm, eventually becoming the doctor's very own symbiote, Scorn. Not too long after this, the United States government captured the Venom symbiote and just pumped it full of chemicals in order to give its host complete control over it, and to prevent Venom from fully bonding with the host. The end result was Agent Venom. Inspired by this, a villain named the Wizard, who has the ability to control people's minds, decided that he wanted to do the same with Carnage to create his own superior Carnage. Originally, the Wizard just wanted to control Cletus' mind, but recent events had left him effectively lobotomized, so there was no mind left to control. He then tried to take over the symbiote's mind, but wasn't able to as well. The only option left was to bond Carnage to a new host and then control that person's mind. So the wizard forcibly drafted his teammate, Dr. Carl Mollis, as the guinea pig, which actually worked. With Mollis at his command, the wizard and his team tried to take over New York, but what I failed to mention is that he was also suffering from dementia. At any point, the wizard's mind could slip, freeing both Carnage and Mollus from his control, which of course, it happened. 
Outraged at being forced to do the wizard's bidding, Mollus revolted, killing his former teammate Claw in the process. The problem there, though, is that Claw is a dude that's literally made out of sound, and when his containment suit was pierced, a huge sonic blast erupted from his body. Which, wouldn't you know, is one of the weaknesses of the symbiotes, that's why he was drafted to be on the team in the first place. Now removed from Mollus, Carnage bonded itself directly to the wizard, and now, with its new host, Carnage continued to wreck shop. That is, until Spider-Man brought out his secret weapon, the brain-dead body of Cletus Cassidy, who Carnage happily jumped onto. Now, this part gets wild, so try to stay with me here. When Claw was killed, his atoms dispersed into the atmosphere, which, remember, are sentient sound. Although they would soon dissipate further, which would make him lose consciousness, Claw managed to pull himself together for one last hurrah, taking revenge for the wizard by blasting Carnage with a sonic lightning bolt from the sky. This separated the symbiote from Cletus just long enough for it to be contained by Spider-Man. And finally, the day was saved. It's worth noting that at this point in time, Spider-Man wasn't quite himself. His mind had actually swapped with Dr. Octopus, which is a whole separate can of worms that needs its own video to explain. But trust me, it's a lot less confusing and is a lot more enjoyable to read than it sounds. Anyway, after capturing Carnage, Spider-Ox sent samples of it to various labs for study. One scientist was infected by her sample, it piloted her body, drained it of its nutrients, and kept leaping from host to host in search of Cassidy. At the same time, though, there was this dude that wanted Carnage all for himself, so he killed Cletus, thinking that when the symbiote came for the body, then it would bond with him. Nope, Carnage actually just bonded with the corpse, which brought Cassidy back to life. Because comics. Eventually, Cletus and Carnage would become separated once again, with the symbiote being locked up, and Norman Osborn used his vast resources to get his hands on it, becoming the Red Goblin. With their powers combined, Norman once again made it his personal mission to kill Spider-Man and everyone that he loves. And he also took this opportunity to kidnap his grandson, Normie, and infect him with Carnage, turning him into his own little minion called the Goblin Child. Red Goblin was a force to be reckoned with, causing incalculable amounts of damage, and even killing Flash Thompson, the man who used to be Agent Venom. Norman was only depowered because Peter made a brilliant attack at his hubris, convincing him that if Osborn had killed him while wearing the symbiote, then the world would attribute that kill to Carnage, not him. As such, Norman tore off the symbiote, and ultimately, that led to his downfall. Carnage then played a huge role in the many, many Venom stories written by Donny Cates, where he became the right-hand man of Null, the god of the symbiotes. Now, although this video is about everyone who's ever worn Carnage, I would be remiss to not mention the time that Carnage was trying to free Null, so he went up against Hulk, who was wearing Venom at the time, and then ripped Venom off of the Hulk and wore Venom like a crown. Well, gotta re-record this section thanks to technical difficulties. In order to free Null from his prison, Carnage was collecting codexes, little bits of symbiotes that are left inside the bodies of their former hosts. Eddie was able to absorb a bunch of them, making a powerful new symbiote out of all these bits and pieces. With this new symbiote swarm, Eddie defeated Cletus by absorbing this Carnage Venom hybrid into it, but the evil of Carnage still rose to the surface. Carnage's presence within the hive started to take over the entire thing, but was separated from Brock in a fiery plane crash. Yet Carnage still wanted to bond with Eddie, so it hunted him down. Desperate to not merge with Carnage, Brock had to resort to chopping off his own hand to prevent it. Even without his hand, though, the hunt continues. Carnage chased Eddie up a huge tower, which was struck by lightning, causing Carnage to be separated from Venom. Unconscious from the blast, Carnage bonded with Eddie. But thankfully, Brock was saved by his son, who is a complicated character that I do not have time to explain in this video. All you really need to know is that he can do this to symbiotes. At the end of the storyline, Carnage was defeated. So he slithered away into the ocean, bonded with a shark, and once again hopped from host to host until it ended up on a guy named Arthur Crane. Not only is Crane very much like Cletus Cassidy in that he's a sociopathic killer, but he's also the son of an anti-alien senator. Arthur's father hoped to capitalize on anti-alien sentiment in a bid to get supporters for a presidential campaign, but Carnage killed him in the middle of a rally to make Senator Crane into a martyr. With his father dead, Arthur became the new face of the anti-alien movement, considering that all of his father's supporters were whipped up into a frenzy following his murder. However, even though Arthur was defeated by Iron Man removing Carnage from him, Arthur was still allowed to work alongside Carnage and his cabal of evil symbiotes. And at the time of this recording, I'm pretty sure that's everyone who has ever been Carnage. 
Dr. Octopus made his first appearance in the third issue of the Amazing Spider-Man series, so he's been around basically as long as the wall crawler himself, and over the decades this dude has done some pretty messed up stuff. So today, we're going to talk all about it. These are the worst things that Doc Ock has ever done. Now, I want to make it clear that for this video, I'm not going to be talking about simple stuff like robbing banks or holding people hostage, because then we would be here all day. But also, this isn't going to strictly be crimes, just bad stuff that Octavius has done. For instance, that haircut might not be illegal, but it sure as hell should be. But in all seriousness, Otto was doing bad stuff even before he became Dr. Octopus. One example is how he approached Dr. Stephen Strange about medical applications for his research. But since Strange was still a pompous jerk back in those days, he rejected Octavius in an extremely dickish manner. A year later, after Stephen had the accident that cost him his hands, Otto saw him on the street, drunk out of his mind. And instead of being the better man and help Strange get back on his feet, Otto just threw a 20 at him. But okay, I know that y'all really want to hear about the stuff that Octavius did after becoming a supervillain. He once used robots to directly take control of the Avengers and had them try to kill Spider-Man. Another thing worth mentioning is that Doc Ock was the original creator of the villainous super team, the Sinister Six. Realizing that none of them could ever defeat Spider-Man on their own, Octavius recruited Electro, Vulture, Mysterio, Kraven the Hunter, and the Sandman to help him out. Although, their first scheme, which was just kidnapping Betty Brant and Aunt May, thus forcing Spider-Man to fight the team one by one to hopefully wear him out, was, um, pretty low stakes. But the Sinister Six has become much more ferocious and deadly over the years, becoming a constant thorn in Spider-Man's side, along with the entire planet, which we will be getting into here in a bit. While kidnapped by the Sinister Six, Aunt May was instantly attracted to Otto, and it sure as hell wasn't Stockholm Syndrome because at this period in time, May was being written as borderline senile and didn't even realize that she had been kidnapped. I go into more information in the dedicated video about May's surprisingly robust love life, but later on she got work as Octavius' housekeeper, and under his employ, Doc Ock intercepted a letter that was sent to her informing May that she inherited an island in Canada that was rich in uranium and also had an abandoned nuclear reactor on it. Now, I'm sure you have many questions, like who left her the island? Why was the facility abandoned? Nobody knows. I mean, hell, I even read an interview about this issue with the book's writer and he didn't comment on it. Anyway, to get his hands on the reactor even though it was abandoned and he could have just, you know, broken it and used it, Dr. Octopus decided to exploit Aunt May's attraction to him and tried to marry her but Spider-Man was able to break up the wedding. However, Otto decided to go to the island despite not having any legal claim to it, which again, he should have just done in the first place, and was intercepted by the mob boss, Hammerhead. When the two of them tussled, the vibrations of the fight caused the reactor to explode, and it was later revealed that Otto survived the experience by wrapping himself in his arms, which is about as absurd as Indiana Jones jumping into a fridge to survive a nuke. But whatever. Despite Octavius seemingly only being interested in Aunt May for her inheritance, he actually developed strong feelings for her. And when he took over all of New York's technology years later, he discovered that she was getting remarried. So he did what any sane person would do when they found out that their ex moved on. Use the combined power of every machine in the city to completely sabotage their wedding. But Spidey was able to beat him, and things went off without a hitch. Well, except for... Aunt May got hitched. But separately from her, Otto also uses connections to have his ex-fiancee fired from her job after their engagement fell through, so it's not like this was new behavior. But okay, let's get off of his love life and into some of the more dangerous stuff. Octavius once hijacked a plane that was transporting a general from an unnamed Asian country, and he held everyone aboard for ransom. Now, considering that the general was apparently a vicious warmonger, it's probably not that much of a bad thing, but the rest of the staff on board was more innocent, and the kidnapping was likely to cause even more national tension, so it's pretty bad. Another time, Ox stole a neutron bomb in order to kill everyone in New York City. This time, though, there was no intent of a ransom, and he was doing it just for kicks. Like, he was even going to give the city just enough of a warning so that people would be aware of their impending doom, and that's messed up. Okay, now this one is just plain bonkers. So Dr. Octopus once again assembled the Sinister Six and used them to launch a chemical into the atmosphere that made cocaine cause people to convulse when they used it. Now, we should hopefully all know that criminalizing addicts is a really bad plan, but even though Otto claimed that he was trying to cure addiction by force with this chemical, he was really trying to exploit the rich and powerful, since lots of them were addicted to coke in the 90s, and his true goal was to exploit them since he had the only cure for his cure, which would allow them to keep using. 
Oh, Ock was also straight up murdering folks during this scene, and also the chemicals that he launched into space were rapidly dissolving the ozone layer. Now, Sandman was trying to be a good guy at this point in time and was only brought aboard because Auk was threatening to blow up the family that he was living with, but when he turned on the Sinister Six, Auk turned him into glass. By the way, this whole thing happened again a couple of years later, but that time, Otto actually shattered him. Anyway, Spider-Man was able to neutralize the chemicals and save the day. But oddly enough, this wouldn't be the only time that Dr. Octopus got involved with climate change. See, Octavius brought together the Sinister Six, again, and sent out a network of satellites into orbit that accelerated the effects of climate change. This led to the hilarious scene of Spider-Man punching the chameleon who was disguised as Al Gore, and this whole plot was for the world's government to pay Octavius and the Sinister Six to reverse the effects of his satellites and cure climate change altogether, once and for all. But in typical Otto Octavius fashion, this was all just a ruse, and he actually wanted to use his satellites to kill more than 99% of the human population. But why not 100%? Well, that's because Octavius wanted society to rebuild and remember what he had done, so that he would have this undying legacy as the world's greatest mass murderer. Now, thankfully Spidey was able to stop him, but only a few months later, Otto pulled off his greatest scheme of all time. See, he was dying, so Doc Opp swapped bodies with Spider-Man, leaving Peter to die in his place. Now, although Otto was flooded with Parker's memories convincing him to become a superior Spider-Man, he still did some pretty messed up shit. For one, Octavius was a ruthless Spider-Man. I'm talking over-brutalizing non-powered supervillains and straight up murdering a guy with a gun. Not only that, though, but Otto protected New York in the most supervillain way possible by hiring minions and putting Spider-Bot surveillance all over the city. Now, sure, it helps prioritize threats, but he was recording millions of civilians with no oversight. And as Spider-Man, Otto ruined Peter's relationship with the Avengers, got him fired from his job at Horizon Labs, blackmailed Mayor J. Jonah Jameson to give him a superhero prison that was being shut down, and worst of all, he jacked off to Peter's memories of Mary Jane. Oh, not to mention that he also used the same technology that he used to take over the Avengers to mind control a bunch of villains that he was illegally keeping prisoner in his base, some of whom he broke out of actual prison to form the Superior Six. Yeah, I mean, he was forcing them to be heroes, but that is still a complete violation of bodily autonomy. Of course, Peter later on regained control over his body and expelled Otto from it, but he made a new cloned body for himself that was a hybrid of his and Peter's DNA to become the Superior Octopus and he joined Hydra when they took over the United States. Now, I understand that it is hard to compete with literally joining the Nazis, but Octavius was able to regain his original form by making a deal with the devil himself, Mephisto. And you know what? I'm pretty sure that literally working with the devil is as bad as it gets. But before I let y'all go, let's talk about some accidental honorable mentions. Perhaps the most notable of Ock's accidental atrocities was the death of Captain Stacy, which happened when Octavius smashed some bricks that fell to the ground below. Captain Stacy, seeing that they were going to hit a kid, jumped in the way and died instead. This was the first time since Uncle Ben's death that someone that Peter had cared about was killed as a result of him being Spider-Man, and it made things really clear to readers that the supporting cast was not safe, something that was proven again when Captain Stacy's daughter, Gwen, was killed really not too long later. Another notable first is that Doc Ock was the first person to ever unmask Peter Parker, but since he was sick at the time and lost a lot of his strength, everyone, Otto included, just thought that Peter had dressed up as Spider-Man to save his girlfriend, whom Octavius had kidnapped. Years later though, he did get to unmask Parker properly and fully learn his identity just a few issues before dying. I'd also be remiss to not mention that when Octavius once worked with a company called New You, they brought people back to life against their will through cloned bodies. Now, most of the folks were cool with this, but they did have a deadly virus and died horrific deaths all over again. Plus, when he later expanded upon New You's technology to create his superior octopus body, his cloning chambers were hijacked by interdimensional vampire beings called the Inheritors, which allowed them to be reborn and wreak havoc on the Spider-Verse. So yeah, all of that wasn't intentional, but it's bad stuff nonetheless. One of the big things that separates Marvel from DC Comics is the fact that they don't really do sidekicks. Instead, they let their young heroes do their own thing. Or they're just a part of the X-Men. But one thing that a lot of people forget is that back in 2012, Marvel decided to give Spider-Man a sidekick of his own in the form of Alpha one of the blandest characters in all of comics. This character just did not work. And that was actually kind of the point. 
Alpha made his first appearance in Amazing Spider-Man number 692 in 2012, and was created by Dan Slott and Umberto Ramos. This kid is named Andrew McGuire. Yes, as in Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire. My personal headcanon is that if he ever shows back up, then we'll find out that his middle name is Tom. Anyway, Andy's origin story intentionally mirrors that of Peter Parker's, in that he's an unpopular kid from Midtown High that took a field trip to a science lab for the demonstration of a lifetime. But here's the twist. This time around, it's Peter who's the one doing the science presentation, because at this time in his life, he was a scientist for a major laboratory. As a scientist at Horizon Labs, Peter is able to invent to his heart's content, which allowed him to create all sorts of cutting-edge technology that he used in his day-to-day -day heroics as Spider-Man, which he then repurposed for Horizon to turn into consumer products. But all of that pales in comparison to his greatest discovery, a brand new energy source. These newly dubbed Parker particles are a hyperkinetic form of energy that is directly tied to the expansion of the universe, and in theory, they can be harnessed for a clean and affordable source of nearly endless power. Now, that's the kind of discovery that has the potential to change the entire world, and after some recent public scandals, Horizon thought that giving a demonstration to these high school kids, and the press, was sure to drum up some positive PR for the company. However, one of their employees is a dude named Tiberius Stone, aka one of the most annoying little twerps in the entire Spider-Man franchise. He got all butthurt when he wasn't allowed to join their boss's private think tank. He's also a spy for the Kingpin, who at this time was leading a clan of evil zombie ninjas because comics. So in revenge, Stone sabotaged Peter's demonstration, which caused the machine harnessing the Parker particles to go awry. Peter did his absolute best to shove the kids out of harm's way, secret identity be damned, but a girl was stuck right in the middle of the danger zone. Now, Andrew had a massive crush on this girl, which encouraged him to muster up the courage to shove her out of the way, but this put him directly in the path of the explosion, causing Maguire to be completely bombarded by Parker particles. But of course, this is a retelling of Peter Parker's origin story, so instead of becoming a puddle of melted teenager, Andy was totally fine. But now, he has superpowers. Though, just to make sure that everything was actually okay, the world's leading superhuman scientists were called in to run a few tests. These abilities are your standard superhero cocktail of super strength, speed, flight, energy blasts, and force fields. Yeah, it's pretty boring and extremely generic. But there's a catch. Andy is only able to use one of these various powers at a time. If he's holding up a falling building, then he's vulnerable to getting shot. If he has to run somewhere with super speed, then that has to be done on foot with no flying. Yet, even though these powers are generic as hell, they have the potential to be cranked up to truly absurd levels. See, Mr. Fantastic had actually discovered these quote-unquote Parker particles years ago, but kept it a secret because they were so potentially dangerous. Because this energy is tied to the expansion of the universe itself, the power that Maguire could harness would only continue to grow, possibly to infinite levels. If powerhouses like the Hulk or the Phoenix Force are labeled as Omega-level threats, then in time, Andy had the potential to become the first Alpha-level threat. In order to not be sued to oblivion by Andy's folks, he was given the opportunity to become the official spokesperson for Horizon Labs as their very own superhero, Alpha. Now, much like any teenager that was suddenly given extraordinary powers and became an overnight celebrity complete with a lucrative contract, Maguire became a massive egotistical showboat. He represented everything that Peter could have become if his Uncle Ben hadn't have died. This prompted Peter to step in and try to show Alpha the ropes. You know, how to keep civilians safe, minimize collateral damage, and of course, that with great power, there must also come great responsibility. All of this went in one ear and out the other as Alpha continued to market himself as the next greatest hero, which gave him the social clout to start going out with his crush. But then he cheats on her almost instantly with the most popular girl in school. Oh, and he also treats Spider-Man as if he is his sidekick and not the other way around. Alpha was quickly getting reckless and dangerous, causing Peter to deem Andy unworthy of his abilities and made it his personal mission to take those powers away once and for all. Under the guise of testing Alpha's abilities in order for him to eventually join the Avengers, Peter ran experiment after experiment on him as a means to find a way to finally strip away all of those Parker particles. But when a big baddie named Terminus came around, the Avengers needed extra muscle to take him down. Without another choice, they needed Alpha. Andy flew right on over and casually overcame his one limit of being able to only use one power at a time by harnessing both his flight and super speed in tandem. And in a matter of moments, Alpha took Terminus down single-handedly, succeeding where even powerhouses like Thor and Captain Marvel failed. But the interesting thing is that Terminus was actually able to get a few lucky hits in, as his lance was able to redirect Andy's energy blast. This was clearly the key to taking away his powers. 
So after stealing the lands for himself and doing a quick off-panel science experiment, Peter invited Andy back for one final test, where he used the lands to depower Alpha as much as he could. There were still some residual Parker particles left over, so he would still have some extremely low-level powers, but Maguire's days as a superhero were over. At least for now. Dan Slott has admitted that the Alpha storyline is one of his few regrets from his time on the Spider-Man series. Alpha just did not work. But not for the reason that you might think. So, originally, this story was supposed to be self-contained in a single supersized issue to celebrate Spider-Man's 50th anniversary. But because of budget changes, Slot was forced to make it into a three-parter. But the marketing for this storyline really tried to drive home the fact that Alpha was the next big thing, heavily advertising this would be Spider-Man's new sidekick, which caused fans to think that he was basically going to become the new Robin, a massively important character to the series moving forward. However, as the issues came out month to month, fans hated Andy, and they didn't think that he fit as a Spider-Man character. Spidey is all about street-level superheroics, and then here comes this random asshole kid with the power of a god. It just seemed like a concept that was not going to work and was doomed for failure. But that's the entire point. Readers were never supposed to like Alpha. He wasn't going to be a character like Damian Wayne, who's an annoying little prick that grows and develops into a great and nuanced hero through significant character growth. Alpha was always designed to be a quick one-and-done role reversal for Peter Parker to learn more about himself. For Alpha to be this dark reflection of what Peter had the potential to become. It's the origin again with a new twist. And the, the bit was going to be the kids and asshole. But it, everyone just got into that rhythm of, oh, this kid is not going to be the new sidekick. Why would they introduce this kid on the 50th anniversary? And, uh, and then by the end of it, good, I'm glad he lost his powers. That story sucked. About a year later, the idea of growing Andy into a more traditional superhero bubbled up, leading to his solo miniseries, Big Time, written by Joshua Hale Fielkov and illustrated by Nuno Plati. It was fine. This was the era of Superior Spider-Man, where Doc Ock took over Peter Parker's body and vowed to be a better Spider-Man than Parker ever could. Well, Otto viewed Andy as one of Peter's greatest failures, and decided to give back some of his powers bit by bit. Of course, though, this wasn't purely altruism. Otto was just using Andy as a guinea pig to see if his powers would be dangerous in the event that he decided to give himself the old Parker Particle treatment, making him a god in addition to a Spider-Man. Now, since we last left him, Andy's parents got a divorce, and he was shipped off to live with his grandma in Pittsburgh. Life was worse forever for old McGuire, though. Not only was he depowered, but his time as Alpha the douchebag was extremely well known, causing everyone at his new school to want nothing to do with him, even the most unpopular kids. But when he got his powers back, Andy legitimately tried his best to try and do things right this time around. Well, try being the key word, because in his first night out, he underestimated his own strength and nearly killed the mugger that he took down. Contact with Alpha's powers caused this injured mugger to morph into a big energy monster that absorbed and assimilated people all over town. And on top of that, Andy's superheroics put him at odds with a local crime lord who he confronted in a way that was clearly meant to lead to a follow-up series, but nothing ended up happening on this front. In all honesty, Big Time is not a book that's worth talking about. It was perfectly average with not much really going on in the way of plot. So as a result, I wouldn't say give it a read. I mean, sure, it did do some rehabilitation to Alpha as a character, but there is a reason that we have not seen this guy since. I mean, sure, there is potential for him to be further retooled into a more interesting character. Because like I've said, there's no such thing as bad characters, only bad writers. But I just don't see it happening. He is just way too generic, and neither one of Alpha's two storylines were good enough for him to develop even a cult following. On top of that, Peter has since taken on a mentorship role for Miles Morales, so having Alpha around would just be redundant. Alpha is just another one of those comic book concepts that's likely to become forgotten to time outside of occasional think pieces like this that go, oh hey, remember that one time that Spider-Man had a sidekick? So, yeah. But hey, if you want to learn more about the world of Spider-Man, then I'm kind of an expert, so be sure to check out my channel for plenty of other Spidey content, like that video I mentioned earlier about every job that Peter Parker has ever worked. Um, I got nothing else to say here. I'm not recording in my usual space, so I I'm going to be real. I'm just a little bit out of it, so make sure to like and subscribe, all that. But anyway, I hope you learned at least a little something new, and hopefully I'll see you next time.